Welcome to the Got Academy podcast. If you're catching this on YouTube, be sure to check out the podcast on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher or Spotify for exclusive podcast content. Captain America. Captain America. Captain Gil America. <laughs> Hi everybody, hello, Theo Ganji. What up, Captain Gil America? <laughs> So happy to talk to you again, the new father, the new captain of the house, <laughs> Captain <laughs> Captain of Brooklyn. We did a review of Endgame right after you became a father, and here we are nine days later, I think. Uh, something close close to it. I don't know. Time has lost all meaning for me ever since my son and Endgame. Uh, yeah, right. Ever since uh, like you've been, uh, people have going back and forth through time. <laughs> exactly. Time has lost meaning. But now we're going back in time. We want to go to the Captain America movies. This is going to be a spoiler-filled uh, review of Captain America. May God rest his soul, even though he's not yet dead. Yeah, that's a, that's a weird thing to say, Gil. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Steve. Uh, Mr. Rogers. Oh, Mr. Rogers sounds a bit Sounds different. ridiculous. Yeah. So we want to go through the Captain America movies, and we actually are in disagreement to you. Yeah. About which of the Captain America movies is the best one of them. Yeah, bitter, bitter, vehement disagreement. Oof, wow, it's going to yeah, be Yeah, it's tough. Actually, we've stopped talking over this, even though we're on this podcast. Now. <laughs> when we're not podcasting, we're not talking anymore. Right? In fact, when we're not talking, we're, yeah. we're not talking at all. You hurt my feelings. You insulted my mother in no. all kinds of no. on ways that I find uncalled for. No, just because I said that your mother is... <laughs> so I'll just talk to the microphone. And if you, if you happen to catch it and, uh, and, and whatever, comment back, <laughs> then that's fine. Then I'll say, I'll say a thing. And then if you, are, if you have to say a thing after I say a thing, fine. But like, I'm, just, I'm never speaking to you again. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that the first Avenger, the first Captain America, is the best of the bunch. I know I'm, I'm, I'm right. being controversial. This is a minority opinion. No, you're just being wrong. It's different than being controversial. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm dead. laughs> it's close because wrong is also controversial. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> controversially wrong. Okay, so let me explain. Let me make my case. And let's see, let's see what you think of it. Absolutely. Go for it. Like two of my favorite things in the world is politics and history. This movie is a snapshot of a very specific time in history, in American history, mm. that some values were very popular and or very popular and prominent during a very, very specific window of time when Captain America was created and his backstory was created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a belief, kind of a mystical belief in science, mm. a naive belief maybe in science, uh, that science can, can solve and cure everything. So Captain America was created right in 1941, like at the beginning, uh, like in the, whatever, mid-war, but before the U.S. entered the war and then Pearl Harbor and stuff. And then, the, and then, the, and then nuclear power, the atom bomb. And up until the Soviets got uh, their own bomb, and then things changed. So I think that was 49, if I remember correctly. I'm sure, not sure. But it was mm. like a certain window in, uh, in time where Americans believed that science was the reason that they won the war and science will be, a, will be the solution to, to the problems. After that came nuclear anxiety, right? The Cold War and then the Cuban Missile Crisis and all kinds of other stuff, and then Spider-Man, right? The radioactive uh, things that are... Mm -hmm. So, in this movie, uh, science is very optimistic, mm. and this is the greatest generation. He's very optimistic, like this can't-do attitude. He doesn't know when to give up when he's beaten. That's like very, like, uh, how America wants to see itself. We don't know when to give up. Mm. I could do this all day. <laughs> so Captain America here is not the bully, the strong guy. He starts out like half a movie or a third of the movie. He's just like this dweeb. And you can easily empathize with him, obviously. That's a very effective uh, trick and manipulation to make you empathize with a superhero. That you see him just very, very physically weak, but emotionally and he's like he's strong, whatever, in spirit. 
the interesting thing, I'm going back to the science bit, when you contrast his magical powers, his superpowers, to the, the bad guy's uh, magical and superpowers, he's European, and there it's really mythical. It's like the powers of the old North, the old Norse. So this mm-hmm. is like old world, mm-hmm. new world mm-hmm. kind of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. That I thought was done very, very, very well. Uh, it's like Nordic uh, kind of... Uh, Nazis, and also this is like the very like the moral certainty of the greatest generation. These are the bad guys. We don't need to talk about it, right? Let's just go and kill them. Yeah, it's good stuff when we just, you know, killed the bad guys and didn't think about yeah. it too much. And then when you take out this guy and this more moral certainty, and you transport him uh, in time to the twenty first century, he just becomes less interesting because he's, he's out of place. It's like it doesn't fit. It doesn't work. But in that context, that historical context, that was what was needed, the political context, and I thought it fits very well. Another thing there that was kind of, kind of that I liked maybe because it reminded me of something that we have here in Israel that I don't like, but it's historically politically accurate. Like he feels Stephen Rogers before he becomes Captain America. Like the only way for him to contribute is to go to the military. This is also something right. very Israeli. If you don't go to, to the military, do your mandatory three-year service, it's as if you're not contributing to society. Right. No, no. This was probably kind of uh, true for its, uh, for its time. Uh, the guy, the scientist, first is, uh, is Jewish, and his name is Dr. Abraham. Right? So Abraham. Hey. Like the father. All right. All right. All right. I... I changed my mind. It's now my favorite movie. <laughs> Yay! So after that, we do we have to go through the motions about right. the other movies? No, 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 no. I didn't realize there was a Jewish scientist who was cool. That's uh, that's a bit. That's it for me. Oh, I'm okay, in. Okay. Okay. Yay. Okay. But just like, but I'll keep Yay. doing my my bit. I'm I'm almost done. <laughs> almost done. Also, like the this is something that 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 you've uh, mentioned. Uh, that is, like Marvel is very local, right? Very New York. So when they ask mm-hmm. him where you're from, he doesn't say like New York. He says Brooklyn, like super Brooklyn. local, and he's running through the Brooklyn streets and stuff. I really, really liked it. So, so in every podcast that I did, like with Ruth, we did the ancient Greece, and now we did the King Arthur. So the ancient Greece, just like with the West, is going back to the days where it was uh, wasn't the bully and the strong favorite, but it was bullied by uh, other stronger forces. So you have to go back to whatever when the Persians uh, were here, and the British who had the empire. They're like, okay, let's. How do we make a movie where we are the underdogs? Ah, okay, the Romans conquered us two thousand years ago. So the American Empire, where uh, how do we go to a time where we were weren't the, the the prohibitive favorite? Ah, okay, Second World War. We are this mm. weakling who just through uh, perseverance and ingenuity and and immigration, all kinds of people coming in from all over the world. We have created this Captain America that is America as we would like it to be. Science and immigration and the American spirit, basically, that's what made America a superpower mm. against the Nazi stormtroopers, Death Stars, Hitler, Emperor, Darth Vader, whatever, mm. all kinds of stuff. And uh, America is here to sacrifice for everybody. And then he's the sacrifice guy, right? Yeah. Okay, I've made my case. You want to make uh, the case for Winter Soldier before you go to Civil War? I feel like it's important to maybe just talk about his overall arc, right? Like, well, first you see him in Avengers, and he's now the guy out of time. He's trying to make sense of his his principles and his sense of the world with this new complicated, you know, set of, you know, different agendas, different powers, different, you know, more much more moral ambiguity. Are the Avengers, is the first Avengers movie in between the two movies? Yeah, so the first Avengers movie is when he was when he comes back. Um, is basically like when he wakes up at the end of of first yeah. Avenger, it sort of takes it picks him up there. Mm-hmm. So it's the first time he really we see him interacting with the modern world. And I think you know Joss Whedon needs some credit for you know laying a lot of groundwork for stuff that paid off uh, for the Russo brothers, where you know they established this contrast between Iron Man and Captain America's Cap. 
is the self-sacrifice guy and Iron Man is the sort of utilitarian um mm. you know the guy who the cynic the, the cynic who does the things for the greater good and they're always as for all these movies you know that have just been wrapped up they're always playing with those two that polarity um okay. you know for me the first avenger you know first of all when it came out full disclosure i wasn't particularly into it as much as i'm a comic book fan captain america never did anything for me um he was just always seemed so you know yeah. plain plain yogurt kind of hero you know he had the silly the silly uniform when i was a kid i was into the x-men they were more right. subversive they were more diverse like this idea right. of a captain america um was just kind of silly to me um yeah i had low expectations and then i did really enjoy that movie uh so, you know because but at the same time i feel like it's there's a lot of easy layups Different. right like like the nazis are such easy layups that they got you know, appropriated into every Star Wars movie, every Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark. I mean, it's like, um, it's like the moral simplicity that, I mean, it's even, I think people have less issues with that than like orcs, right? Like they're, <laughs> they're the, they're the yeah, perfect yeah, bad yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, the first movie is definitely not a complex movie. It's just, it's, it's, right, I would right. say it's effective, but, uh, but you're right in your criticism. Definitely. Well, I think I, my criticism Still, even as much as I enjoyed Captain America films and the uh, performance, uh, Chris Evans, I think, brought, brought something to that role that like I, I never really foresaw connecting with. At the same time, like he's like the self-sacrifice guy who basically self-sacrifices, and it's like we, you know, we get that in in the first Avenger where he's like, you know, jumps on the grenade in training. Uh, and it's like, oh, he's a self-sacrifice guy. And then what's the climax of the movie? He self-sacrifices again, you know? Um, and then the sort of, and it, so it, they left him with a little, with not a ton of room, not a lot of, of, of stuff to do once you establish him. So it's kind of like you get this, there's a sense of repetition to his movies where it is Cap asserting his sort of sense of moral duty on this complicated world, on this complicated mo modern yes. world. And ever so slightly, he inches toward complexity um, while maintaining what makes him Cap, right? So Winter Soldier, it challenges Cap in a lot of ways, but ultimately he doesn't, I think, evolve so much as he adapts, right? Like a lot of, we're, we've seen Iron Man truly evolve, right? As a person, as a character. In contrast, Cap adapts, but does he evolve? Does he change? I don't know. Um I don't know that we really see that from him. I think, and ironic, funnily, you know, the the Russo brothers who got who made their bones with these Captain America movies, also not Captain America fans, uh, also had the mm -hmm. same reaction um, as I described. They were huge comic book fans, never liked Captain America, which maybe is what you need to make a compelling movie: is to bring some guys in who are just who aren't content with the typical tropes. Um, so they were able to push Cap, you know, push the character. Uh, it's really interesting for a Marvel movie. When you look at how those 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 films are written, you know they're not. They, Cap doesn't quip. Cap doesn't make little clever comments. You know, and that was a signature Marvel style for a lot of those movies. Was these clever little comments, action. You know, Joss Whedon style, right? Um, Winter Soldier. Cap's playing it pretty straight. He winds up being challenged in the sense that the organization that he's a part of isn't what he thought it yeah. was. The bad guy isn't who he thought it was. And it connects him back in a very, I think, satisfying personal way to when it, to his old life in Bucky Barnes, where I think the, the the sort of hero achievement of that film, right, is that he's willing to let Bucky kill him. Is that canon that Bucky is alive? Is that something from the comic books? This Bucky character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was I'm not sure how long ago, but it's a really popular story arcs guy Ed Brubeck, I think his name was a uh, writer. He brought back Bucky as the Winter Soldier. And actually, eventually becomes Captain America, which huh. looks like they're skipping um, skipping him for for the Falcon uh, in the MCU, which makes sense. I mean, my issue with Bucky is like, yeah, like you could always be hypnotized by these people and turn into a murderous monster. Uh, just say he's going to these lengths. Well, I'm, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but like I, I didn't um, think Bucky was a very compelling the, character, and I didn't think that going back right. to the bad guys from the first movie, just bringing them back. It was, I was less engaged and, and just, again, displacing 
this person from a time without moral ambiguity, where, more, where moral inambiguity works and placing him in a time where it doesn't work, it just made him a little bit uh, annoying. And just like I wasn't really able to connect with him as a character. And in the first movie, he did evolve, right? He had to adapt to his new powers and just uh, decide who he is, whatever. I got you. Uh, but you use the term evolve and adapt uh, interchangeably. I don't yeah. know if he really evolved. I mean, he was always the guy who won't quit. Yeah. Who won't, and that was why they gave him power. So in Winter Soldier, I think, again, it's not exactly an evolution. It's more that he's sitting there saying, like, I'm going to use my Captain American-ness in this situation now. Mm -hmm. And that means I'm going to let Bucky kill me if he doesn't come to. Right? And then so and Bucky winds up sort of pulling him out of the river and, and saving him, even though he's still in that sort of trance-like murderous state. So I think that was cool, but yeah, it left me a little... Mm. Um, I think the action in that movie was, was really phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and that may be part of why people love it so much. Let's it's, talk about the elevator scene. Elevator scene is classic cinema, man. I mean, it's just... You know what's really cool is watching the, the, the rehearse oh. that scene. Um, I think Evans posted some of that on his, on his Twitter. And it's really cool, man. These guys like were in such top condition and it's amazing choreography. And they really wanted you to feel the power of these guys so i love all of that but yeah i agree um none of these mo these movies didn't really budge my needle until civil war and i think civil war is my favorite captain america movie because it's not really a captain america movie but before we get there i have some more stuff about the winter soldier i mean i'm not i mean i'm not speaking to you but you can say stuff <laughs> and so uh, there's a, a few like american uh, themes very american themes like if you trade the uh, freedom for security then you deserve uh, neither or mm -hmm. something, right? That's like a Ben Franklin mm -hmm. uh, quote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. apt mm -hmm. there. Okay, so the first movie, the, the, the enemy was outside, was the other, the Nazi. And now the enemy is within. It's in us. It's in each of mm -hmm. us, right? We can become, mm -hmm. if we become mm -hmm. extreme, extremist, extremist, then then we can be the enemy it's also very american in the way that america likes to see the, itself as like a pragmatic not ideological like the, the old world you had the communists and all kinds of like the crazy ideologies that uh, destroy the world in america it's built in itself right the uh, checks and balances to be very pragmatic not that it's very working very well uh, right now mm. but you know like the senate and the congress <laughs> yeah, but just like uh, you know, things change in history, so we have to evolve. It's not a knock uh, on America, so but uh, oh, by by all means, knock America uh, these days. <laughs> yeah, these days definitely, but not America in itself. Uh, I think it's just like uh, a part of uh, of the political spectrum that we also suffer from the same disease. So, uh, I mean, I I guess, and it's hard to. I mean, one of the tr the the hard parts about what some people including myself a bit have trouble with you know looking back too fondly on the greatest generation is there was a, a whole lot of injustice that was you know swept under the rug and covered up by the fact that they were so right in that essential conflict for global yeah. supremacy um but there was so much fucked up shit from that time and you know in the in the sense it, i feel like we get the modern world sort of you know gets blamed for for it for exposing it but it was you know this is part of our legacy you know not to get too down that rabbit hole but it certainly puts a little context on like well we really pat ourselves on the back a whole whole lot for you know being right against the nazis um but there was <laughs> so much foul happenings discrimination racism yeah. um that we're still unpacking yeah. and have never apologized for the way germans have right um you know oh yeah wow yeah you know, Germans are incredible in that way. Incredible. Yeah. No, and we're terrible. I mean, we're terrible. Just what you said is exactly the tension between the first movie and the second movie, right? Right, exactly. So, the first, yeah. so it speaks exa exactly to that. So, okay, we were right against the Nazis. Big fucking deal. Now we have our own Nazis. No, I mean, I will say big, like, right against the Nazis is a big fucking deal. And that should be celebrated. I, will, I, will <laughs> I don't want to step on that point. Right. But it's also, okay... You have two oceans on either side. Right. It's very right. easy to yep. come to yeah. the defense of people who are just there. 
<laughs> just there, like they have nowhere to go. They have nowhere to go. Right. Uh, so it's it's easier to be a superpower when you're so far away from all the crazy people who are doing crazy, crazy things. Last, maybe also something that is very American that it's not necessarily really like, but it's like a, it's like a trope, you know, like a movie trope. It's like the bravery of the individual in the face of authority of government in order to maintain freedom it's just like like the lone cop rogue cop right yes he's going against yes. no, by the book by book right from the simpsons and stuff right no it's the i'm i'm glad you brought that up um yeah cuz that's that's so it's so essential to our mythology uh and it's a part of why um you know detective comics right spawned out of a you know detective um stories from from the 20s and 30s and into the 40s that were very popular uh and the 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 central theme tended to be there's this rogue private investigator character yeah who he wasn't a crook he wasn't a cop right and in a sense you know if you check out dashiell hammett's work who's who's super you know, influential about this stuff and uh it it's this lone american assertion of his moral authority his moral code that we trust much more than we do trust the uh you know the the powers that be or you know the certainly not the new york city penal code you know we trust the lone individual so but this also brings us into why i find civil war the film so compelling but last um, thing last thing last thing here about yeah, your yeah, point about it. the point that you just raised that i find it so so fascinating so do you do you watch hindi movies sometimes or have you watched hindi movies uh i would say uh not really not really no. okay so there's Or a lot of uh, zero. Yeah. zero okay so there's a lot of theme like the major theme is love okay you have also action action movies but like the romantic movies you have love and it's always like love love marriages and love like bigger than life and it's and basically it's an outlet for a reality that is opposite because most of the marriages it's a change a little bit but not really when you look at the numbers most of the marriages are arranged marriages and are not love marriages right so they have like but but like all of the romantic movies like half of their of their industry which is much bigger than hollywood is about uh, uh, people who are who are fall in love in an incredible way something that is not really there in their reality and in the same way if we compare if i look at americans if i compare them to israelis they are we are more like the whatever private eye who just does his whatever does what he wants to do and americans seem to toe the line and just like uh, follow the law and do and follow the rules and do what they have to do of course you have advantages and disadvantages to every single uh, to to both sides uh, to doing things and oftentimes it's frustrating here when people just do whatever they want to do but sometimes it's it's nice that people can just think outside the box and Amer- and, mm. and americans in general If you want to talk to a service person or something it's just like everything is really like for Israelis it's interesting because it's very frustrating that it's the opposite of uh, going rogue so maybe that's also like kind of like an outlet of like having this hero this fantasy of what we would like to be but basically we're not most people who work in like a corporate jobs and uh, and follow the law like cops are much more uh i don't know imposing in america than they are uh here i think yeah i think well i th- i think i mean my you know i'm not sure i would characterize of course i know you know the americans i've known you know or the people i don't know that i've that have been in my life or i'm friends with i mean i don't know anybody who's particularly by the book to be honest hmm. with you okay. um And our cops, I think part of the reason our cops are so imposing is because they're not by the books, and we know that. And they'll do whatever, they have their own hero complex, and they're dying to flex uh, on whoever, uh, and that's part of why I think, you know, they're so problematic, <laughs> that, um, you know, they, that are, you know, at least NYPD certainly has a, has a, a notion of their own heroism, that enables them to be you know abuse their power um that i think kind of fits in line with that american self-mythologizing um so i don't know okay. i don't know that i but i also i also think 
you know, it's the, our point of views are so different, you know, outside, inside kind yeah. of thing. But I also think the, you know, the greater American comparing it to Israel, it's just so large, it's yeah. so gigantic um, that there are just w- so many more um, systems in yeah. place. In America, uh, to to get caught up yeah. in to get yeah to get caught up in as American, but let's 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 I would love to take it back to our go movies. for it. Go um, for it. <laughs> the uh, what I like about Civil War is, in a sense, it starts to challenge the mythology, the self mythologizing of the American hero. Right? It basically it opens with Iron Man's sense of like let's go kick ass has blown up in his face. Right? Um, you know, he says. When he's challenged by that that woman whose whose child was you know killed in the Segovia um, you know from the previous movie from Age of Ultron, and and he's affected by it and he wants to do something about it. Now he's a little maybe he's a little extreme about it. Uh, you could argue, but what he's attempting to do is to take this hero ethos and to excuse me make it to make it more simpatico with the collective and say we can't keep operating yeah. with this idea that just because we're strong enough that that means we're always right and any choice we make is yeah. valid even if the choices we make are valid they haven't been approved by any uh you know by any mm. by any process by any official collective and i think in our you know civil war is interesting because it challenges us in the way we watch movies right are we you know, looking at this the way we really look at these kinds of issues, because of course we accept the fact that, you know, deadly force has to be regulated by our governments, right? That's not controversial. You know, the, the, we, I think the closest thing to superhero nowadays, right, that could potentially cross sovereign borders, it's an independent power, you know, something like Facebook, right? That uh, could you know, has the has the potential to upset the world order, yeah. and is a big challenge on uh, the authorities that be. It's how are you going to respond to this? It, there's a power struggle now between Facebook and governments, right? Yeah, and that's it's like kind of close to the power struggle between the Avengers and governments, right? And like what. What are we going to do about? It? Are we really going to let Facebook decide who gets to be president every year? Um, are, are, are we? Are, I mean, seriously, are, are we going to let? Is our? Is that right? Is that right? It's not even a Facebook. It's just like uh, Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like there was this op-ed, right? Uh, I, I assume you read it if you're mentioning Facebook uh, by this uh, co-founder, right? Right. Uh, I didn't, but I I saw the headline, and I'm I'm kind of been following what he's been saying. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. So he he calls him Mark throughout throughout the the opera, which I thought was very interesting. Like whenever he's talking yeah. about how he has too much power and too much influence, he just says, he says Mark. Like he knows him. Yeah. It's not Zuckerberg. Yeah, something. Yeah. Just like Mark. He's Mark. So this is one guy who has too much power. The way I, I the way I watched the movie, it was more about American exceptionalism in the world, right? So you can go into Iraq, into Libya, into whatever, because, right. uh, Vietnam or, or Korea, if you go back further, and because you have the right uh, values, then you are inherently right in what you do. Right. And, and then you have the UN, you have whatever, the, the, oppo- the, the, the opposing view, right? Uh, you have to go, uh, we have to, to, to make alliances, to decide that together. And, uh, and both sides have some value to them. You know, I'm not into global wars and stuff. But if you put all your chips in, in a global uh, alliance, global structures that are not very effective, that's also, there are problems also in that when you... Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No, I think, I think that, yeah, that's, that's well said. And to, just to give credit to a superhero movie for being able to succinctly demonstrate what you just said um, in a pretty complex world was a very impressive feat. Uh, the, you know, the... This issue of Cap saying, you know, people have agendas and agendas change. Well, it's like everything. I feel like Cap's argument is like, well, if you're still in your head in a superhero movie, then of course Cap is right, right? Because we're in this space, we're in this self mythologizing, we're watching this movie to fulfill the fantasy of the most powerful people also being the most ethical people, yeah. always doing the right thing, yeah. right? So if you're in that headspace, you're going to be like, yeah, why should this, you know, crusty government agent be able to tell Cap what to do, right? Yeah. And so you're going to be on that side. And it's it really striking to me how 
people watch that movie and come away with it on the on the opposing sides and hmm. and not necessarily appreciating how how what a tightrope act the the writers and directors uh, made it. I mean, people watch that movie and will and will and will finish it and turn around and to be like, well, clearly Cap is right, and the filmmakers know it. And and someone else will watch the movie. What do you, what do you talk? Mm. Clearly, the filmmakers know Iron Man was right. What do you talk? And like with very little self awareness. And I've seen these debates online. And actually, I've taught this this film in a in a class we did on uh, comic books and crime with this uh, Koto with a sociology professor that wrote a book on it. That was nice. terrific. Actually, name's Nikki Phillips. Uh, comic book crime. You should check out her book. Uh, it was absolutely terrific. But it was very interesting the way people got very strong reactions. And they also projected their reactions on the filmmakers. And that not only did they feel that they were interpreting the story correctly, uh, but they thought that the filmmakers were interpreting it like them and they were just responding to what was there. I mean, when I saw it, I was, I was, on, I was on Team Iron Man. But ironically, uh, you know, I read those comics um, and I hated Iron Man in the comics. Uh, they, okay. The way they wrote that, the way they wrote that storyline, he, be- he became... Uh, like a, he became a fascist. It was weird. Like um, he became, he started this extra ju- judicial punishment for superheroes who wouldn't comply with the accords, ah. or it wasn't accords. It was some other, it was some other thing. But it was basically the same idea. Um, and like they, he would like jail them in the negative zone um, without due process. And I was like, whoa! Mm. And it really, it really got carried away. Uh, so I was really happy to see them scale back his art iron man's argument and make it reasonable and personal you know it came from a personal place from him uh and it's a really it's a big it's yeah. a real contrast and i think the i think the russos and the writers i actually think they worked a lot closer with robert downey jr in that captain america movie than they did than they ever did with chris evans uh that the tony stark character he's always been the kind of heartbeat of of this story and in a way, Cap is more of a foil, I think, for him. Um, you know, because he's 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 a little bit of a flat line in his in his character yeah. arc. Over all these movies, we're describing different things happen to him. He adapts. He doesn't evolve. You know, I found him frustrating in Civil War for not evolving when it came to Bucky. Right? Uh, when you know, you know, I can't imagine. You know, the end of that scene, the end of that film. Where a lot of the arguments have fallen away, uh, you know, Iron Man has recognized that he's in a superhero movie, and in a superhero movie, of course the government is full of shit, and of course you have to go with, you know, the heroism of the individual, and so he adapts to that, he comes around, and then he's confronted with watching his own parents get murdered by the dude standing next to him, and what does his buddy Cap do, but, like, jumps his ass and fucks him up, like, I, I just... That that to me was was so foul. Like that Cap was so ready to take. Like he knew that Bucky killed them. He knew that, and he was still beat the shit out of Iron Man. It's like, yeah, your parents yeah. are dead, and I'm and I got the killers back, and fuck you, yeah. and I'm gonna kick your ass. Like so, I was like, what? Like that felt. I I get like that we're supposed to under feel that Cap loves Bucky so 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 deeply, but to me that um, you know, but I will say. I reacted that way to that scene, but so many people felt that Cap was right. <laughs> so so many people reacted, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah, felt that them. Cap had, you know, I fe- that's what I say, right? I say really good for them because that's harder than it seems uh, yeah. to to do in a drama. Um, but the most compelling arguments in movies and books, everything is that are the arguments where both sides are right, you know, right, and. So, so that was. I thought that was great. I didn't feel like both sides were right when I was watching it, but other people really felt that Iron Man was being. He was just being pouty or whatever by just wanting to punch Bucky in the face um, for killing his parents. Oh, and I'm pouty like, yeah. about uh, wanting to punch the person who killed your parents. Is that uh, pouty? Is that uh, <laughs> he did watch I've, his well, parents look, die? <laughs> I'm trying to reflect a point of view that I do not share. Um, <laughs> so you're so maybe <laughs> you're undermining <laughs> the argument. Maybe my language undermines it slightly, yeah. but like, what do you want, dude? What yeah. do you want from a dude that just found out that the guy standing next to him murdered his parents? What do you want from that? Like, we have accepted that Batman will go on a lifelong crusade to avenge this, and yet we can't accept that Iron Man might want to like want to 
pop him in the jaw without Captain jumping in and double teaming him and beating the shit out of him. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's a problem with that. Um, he's also like you know, uh, Robert Downey Jr. has like more. He's more uh, has more tricks up his sleeve to make you you know connect with him. Care and the character. He has more, and he has more influence on scripts. So mm-hmm. and if you look at if you look at that film, that film has more. Con- character development than all the other Captain America films combined and none of them are Captain America's character Tony goes through several distinct revolutions of character, of thought of sense of responsibility in that film and Captain America goes from I love Bucky and want to defend him to I love Bucky and want to defend him Uh, (laughs) so why I like that movie I guess is in a sense because it because and, you know, I honestly wonder, you know, I think they, they had to give Robert Downey Jr. something like $50, $75 million just to be in a Captain America movie. Uh, if they had made that Iron Man 4, which they very easily could have done, justified, um, if they'd made that Iron Man 4, they may have had to give him $150 million. I don't know. You know what I mean? So that might be, they, they want, like, yeah. they, they're like, well, we want to keep telling Iron Man's story, but we can't afford it. <laughs> um yeah, actually, you know what? So, something that I found really interesting. It was after after we spoke. So I watched it like a, like a while ago, but you know a little bit half heartedly. And then we talked about it, and then I, re- I rewatched it. And just like yeah. so, like the sense that I got from Captain America because he is uh, from whatever the greatest generation, and because he doesn't change, doesn't evolve, as you said. So in my head, he was just like conservative. But then you mentioned, and uh, it was apparent in the in the second time that I watched it, that they managed to to you said like walk this fine line where it's not partisan in the way that it is like both characters. It's, it doesn't reflect right. like, a, like 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 both uh, like two the, the, like the both sides of the aisle, both sides do it kind of thing. That right. that was really yeah. that was kind of impressive. How they managed to keep the uh, the ideological basis for both characters be like b- going both ways and intertwined and still be very cohesive and not all over the place. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I would say the comics have been pretty good at that for a long time. That that Cap will uh, Captain America. Where one of the reasons I would not respond well to him is to think of him as this flag bearing, like, you know, the way some of these other, you know, yahoos in this country are. Yeah. But he was always kind of like bringing this other sense of America, uh, an older sense of America to the modern world that felt that, you know, they t- did a good job in saying this guy is not, he's not a government stooge at all. In fact, if you apply like that 40s American spirit to today, he'd look like a rebel. And that was kind of how he was in the Civil War in the comics, um, Mm. where he was, you know, the government was basically giving Captain America a mandate and Captain America was saying no in defense of some version of American values. I thought that was good. Um, I thought that was pretty cool. And they and he he made a, a sacrifice. They he dies in that as a result of that storyline in the comics. I mean, not for for long, but you know he died. Uh, <laughs> so it, it 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 was more that he had more to do there than stick up for Bucky, which ultimately felt like felt like it was what he sac he sacrificed his relationship with Tony. Bucky, knowing knowing full well that that this guy, you know, is dangerous, not by his, not because he wants to be, but it, that doesn't change the fact that, like, I guess if you know, you know, the right four Russian words, <laughs> or is it Russian or German words, that he's that he'll he'll turn around and murder you in your face. Like, I, I don't know, yeah. it, that seemed like Cap should have cared a little bit about that, um, but he uh-huh. didn't at all. Um, so yeah, so I had like, and how do you connect uh, all that to I, to Endgame? So let's go to the end. Well, of, to yeah, the end I mean, of, uh, Captain yeah, let's the end of the arc. I mean, I feel that um, there was that great scene that was a kind of payoff in Endgame when Tony, you know, gets back uh, in the spaceship and he's all like emaciated and, you know, and and he basically gets to shove it in Cap's face about the argument from Civil War, you know, and say, like, you know, you said right. that we were going to face this together. And guess what? Where were you or whatever, whatever he said, whatever he was going through. Um, he's like, I wanted to put a suit of armor around the world and this is what happened and you didn't. And this is what happened. 
Um, I thought that that was very effective. Uh, I thought that Cap coming out of that um, and maintaining his his kind of his sense of optimism and duty, I thought was really well done um, and definitely brought me back to the fold on him in terms of liking him as a character. You know, they they did strikingly little with him in Infinity War, um, which I thought was remarkable, you know, for uh, a major character like that. Um, major actor like that in Infinity War to have like four or five lines and a beard. I like the beard. <laughs> um, wear black. Yeah. So the so the overall you know arc right where he's the one he's the one that that brings Iron Man back, um, you know, to do the time heist, and you know I actually had I have mixed feelings about the resolution which why everybody. So here, here's my thing. Um, is the one thing that you convinced me of that through the course of all these movies that you started with this guy in the 40s he ends in in avengers you know he he starts in avengers and he's this guy at a time right Mm. he's this 40s guy in the modern world and then the modern world goes to town on him in a lot of different ways right in winter soldier in civil war in uh in infinity war the modern world has has really leaned on cap and made him um made him adapt made him and that's part of what's amazing about him right is that he does adapt he does he learns all the new fighting styles right he he he's the um you know he's sat he he's savvy in a way that he never was before um so what i liked about his the ultimate end of his arc that he decides to get a life that he decides to settle down i think that's right um you know when you're when you're looking at it in the scheme of contrasting him as a foil to Tony Stark. Definitely. Uh I think I think that they did such a good job especially the Russos convincing me that he was no longer a man out of time that for him to uh. go back in time to live his life felt wrong. It felt uh-huh. like like I believed him. I know you see it felt wrong in that sense and in a poetic sense it felt right. In the poetic sense of the way to end a movie with that dance it felt right like it 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 don't but i say what it only feels right if you knew that the actor's not coming back and you had to end the character but did i believe that he was really done you did all this work in infinity war to convince me that he's never done and you're telling me that there's no more bad guys you know that whatever this alternate universe uh, life he retired to he boom. was able to not care about bad guys anymore boom ah that that didn't that wasn't sold to me as his character oh um, that's a very good point it wasn't sold to, yeah, it wasn't sold to me as his character to to that he really wanted to reject the modern world and that he would have been comfortable in this past version of himself. I feel like that's an idyllic thing that ultimately he had grown too much. Um, his outlook had shifted too much. He was he is too much a creature of this world now to be happy and comfortable um, yeah. back in time and without um, telling anybody right that's also a kind of like now that you mention it that's very a little bit uh, on captain america like like maybe in in some ways it is like, uh, it is kind of like him just like to do what he thinks is right but you don't want to maybe set up uh, the future how the world will move on without you how you'll protect everybody without you how your values will live on uh mm-hmm. It's interesting. I didn't think. Of, yeah, because I also knew that he had to, that his arc w- would have to finish in some way. So maybe that, maybe they were banking on most of the people knowing that his arc has to be completed. Exactly. No, they really were, and they did that beautifully in a lot of ways. They played with this idea that that that's why I don't think they minded that Chris Evans was like did that tweet about oh this was a great experience and like so everyone going into this thinking cap's gonna die cap's gonna die yeah. and the trick was that iron man dies uh so i don't feel like they minded that um but if you really look at you look at the way the russos make their movies anytime there's an iron man moment that's important it is fully realized it is fully written it is given given downey jr the stage and room to improv to do all those amazing little things he does and then when it's time for chris evans to have a moment he's literally standing behind the glass and staring at a woman on the other side and then that's it (laughs) or he's dancing with a woman he doesn't even get lines bro like it's it's and you know what it works as a movie but it's also interesting to see like wow there's a real um 
there's a maybe it's a, a difference in talent. I don't know, or or the just investment on the different. part of the filmmakers. The yeah, true, yeah. true, true. Right, he's he's a less right. He is he's a less verbal yeah. uh, guy. So it does work. I, I feel yeah. Yeah. and less and complex. The, and the contrast also. works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And and the contrast complex. works yeah, yeah. exactly. A very interesting conversation, I think. I don't know uh, which one is the is the <laughs> is the best movie now. <laughs> well, I feel like all of your all your regard for that first movie has a lot to do with like your feelings about the time and place, yeah. and less about. I mean, less about. You didn't even mention the Red Skull and getting yeah. shattered into space, and I mean, yeah. all that stuff was so. I just it's so it's such conventional superhero stuff, and we're so past that yeah. now. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard to like really enjoy. Uh, um, that style of movie that you could feel you feel when you watch the movie you feel like that was when film they were still filmmakers were still in, in charge and I say that I know that may sound funny um, but it was you know now now that kind of Feige and these real comic book heads have have mm-hmm. provided a better blueprint for telling these stories it's like the, it's the it's the comic book uh, ideas that are in charge mm-hmm. With with first Avenger, it was the filmmakers that had to connect it and sell it. So it's it's made like you could very easily take that out of the MCU and it would make no difference. You know? Right. So I, like uh, like to that point about why I enjoyed the first movie so much, I think this is why I, I just I like also doing doing this content, the the podcast and the videos and stuff. It's when you bring to a movie or to a show uh, uh, knowledge that you have about history or psychoanalysis or science or philosophy, whatever uh, thing that is, uh, that is in the videos, then the experience is enhanced and the enjoyment is enhanced. And just, uh, right. and just because I had, like this was, it's a very interesting time for me, like modern American history, since the Second World War and afterwards and all that. Again, that specific time of the beginning of the, of the Cold War. It's just like I felt as if you got like a fossil, you found a fossil, uh, that is that could only have been made in this specific era. So I'm I'm guessing it's like a more of a like a personal experience. Just like it just like made the whole movie so much better, and I didn't mind so much that the villain was just like totally boring, uninteresting, mm-hmm. because I I got to enjoy it from like from from another sense, and this is again. Mm-hmm. So if I go to the whatever the Got Academy content and stuff, so. If I know more about the the psychoanalytical nature of the characters, then when I when I watch uh, a movie or a show, then I get to enjoy it more. And again, with science or mythology or whatever, like I got to enjoy. Okay, so the only reason that I didn't suffer during the uh, 1981 Excalibur uh, movie that I mentioned before was because of Lord of the Rings. And, uh, and our videos about mythology and uh, all, and that kind of stuff. Man, we, we could uh, we gotta we gotta we gotta. Uh, I'd love to take a crack at that. Um, you know, I've taught King Arthur for a while, and man, that's a deep that's a deep dive. You know, that is a deep deep dive as a as a, a, a works of literature that came together for them to put together that film mm. but for another day you can li- okay so li- so you can listen to the to that podcast and maybe you can do like a second part of it and just like uh, whatever yeah it might be cool yeah 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 but it will take some time until we post it because i have some others uh, in line like a month or so or more yeah yeah but that'll sure. be fun that'll be fun okay so uh theo that was uh, again a lot of fun a lot of fun a lot of fun gil it's too bad i'm never speaking to you again <laughs> until the next time but uh, this is not so. The podcast is not our only collaboration, uh, CEO. You are a novelist, uh, writing professor, rich literature professor, and we have collaborated on a Game of Thrones book. That's right. The Thrones Effect. The Thrones Effect. How GOT conquered the mm, pop culture. Exactly. So, 10, ten uh, chapters. You wrote one of them. I wrote another one and co wrote another one with the Nogar collaborator. And then seven other YouTubers. Each one wrote a chapter talking about. Uh, a different angle of how and why uh, Game of Thrones has become such a pop culture phenomenon. And I actually mentioned your chapter in a podcast that I recorded the other day with Rutger about King Arthur, three King Arthur movies. Mm, mm, mm. That's going to be posted after this one. 
and they're watching a, 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 an old uh, King Arthur movie from 1981, Excalibur. It reminded me of your chapter because everything in this real myth reminded me of the imagined myth, if you will, of Lord of the Rings, as if the uh, the imagined myth was something more like culturally more real than the myth that has been there for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of King Arthur and not the other way mm. around as if King Arthur was inspired by Tolkien and not Tolkien by mm. this was uh, like uh, something that you mentioned in your chapter did I did I yeah he, he was a big uh, Arthur was a huge influence for Tolkien for sure for sure and that Excalibur man that's a great movie uh, I love that movie I hated it <laughs> oof so Jeez. oof Shots fired. All right. Man, it's a good thing we're not talking. Yeah. So there you Sorry, go. But I got to go. Noga yeah. is waiting for me at our neighborhood cafe. We're going to go and meet up and then watch a Game of Thrones episode today. Like when you're listening to this, this I think I think I'm going to post it'll it on the, Tuesday. But this is Sunday right before the episode five. So it'll be in the past. It'll be in the past. So guys, I want to... My condolences... For that terrible episode of Game of Thrones that we all watched. No, why terrible? I hope it's not terrible. I really hope it's not terrible. Let's cover our bases. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Most likely it will be terrible. No, but I think... (laughs) It's most likely it will be terrible. (laughs) But I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy it. God damn it. God damn it. Yeah. Two more episodes to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So actually, you know, so again, this this goes to the first uh, to the first movie. I think I'm enjoying uh, like I, I'll be able to enjoy these episodes more, the final episodes, just because of the historical political context uh, that I hope will be there, the reformation, whatever of the power structure and stuff. And then I can ignore uh, balls jokes and uh, rushed arcs and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Dude, that, that's very that's that's very adorable that you think D&D <laughs> care about the political structures and reformation <laughs> and historical illusions no. and whatever else. No, that's... Yeah. <laughs> that's adorable. No, that's very sweet. After the show, <laughs> we'll talk about it after the show. Sure. All right, sounds good, brother. Okay, so thank you, uh, Theo, and uh, give my love to your wife thank and you, kid. We'll do, and we'll, we'll do, do next do. week the Iron Man. And we'll try to do next week the Iron Man. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, Theo. All right, you take care, and guys, pick up time. that. Um, pick up the our, the our Thrones effect. The uh, Thrones our effect. book, our the Thrones effect. Yeah, I'll put a link and at Amazon. You can find me on Twitter at TPR Ganji. And Gil, what, you're at GOT Academy, is that right? GOT, was it underscore? Underscore. Yeah, at TPR Ganji. There's no underscores for me. For no underscores. And also, just, uh, you know, tell your friends and stuff. I don't know if you have friends who enjoy Marvel and stuff. Even if you don't have friends, <laughs> it's okay. We still like you. We'll be yeah, your friends. Yeah, but they're not as valuable as uh, listeners if they're not, uh, if you don't have friends. <laughs> I I don't feel that way about you if you don't have friends. I, I am your friend. And I feel you're more likely to keep listening to us as a sort of friend proxy. So oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so Theo will be your friend. <laughs> Gil Gil will look down on you and me for being your friend, but I yes. will not care and will be your friend regardless. Yes, yes. I have enough friends. I don't need any more friends. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think we lost all our all our listeners now. <laughs> you lost all your listeners. Uh, they, they like, like me. you, yeah. right? Okay, go. Peace.